Good evening. Welcome to the Astronomical Society Victoria's first live stream event. Uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, the Astronomical Society of Victoria acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, sea and community. We pay our respect to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. This weekend, we hope to share with you the wonders of the night sky, starting tonight with a discussion on what telescope to buy, followed by a tour of the night sky with the ASV's very own Perry Vlahos. Following this, we will, subject to clear skies, have a look at some of the planets in our solar system live streamed into your homes using some of our members' astronomy equipment. Uh, but you certainly don't need special equipment to enjoy the night sky. So with that in mind, let me introduce you to Perry Vlahos. Perry, welcome on board. Hi, Mark. Um, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us in our very first live streaming session. Hopefully we can get through any little hiccups. But I also hope that we can bring a little bit of joy, a little bit of happiness to everybody in this time of uh, uncertainty with the COVID crisis. Now, the very first thing we're going to talk about this evening is telescopes, because everybody knows that you get into astronomy with a telescope. Well, that's not exactly always true, but let's pretend that it is. And we're gonna tell you which telescopes to avoid and which telescope the ASV recommends as a beginner instrument for anyone wanting to get into visual astronomy. So uh, with that in mind, Mark, let's, begin the slideshow. There you go. First one up. Is it really? I was expecting a different one. Oh, oh there you go. First one up. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, as you can see, there are an awful lot of different types of telescopes, even just by looking at this picture. Um, there's skinny ones, there's fat ones, there's long ones, there's short ones. So which one do you buy? Because there are so many brands, so many different types. And looking at this picture right here in front of you, the ASV only recommends out of all those telescopes there, just one as a beginner instrument. Let's go on a little bit further and find out something about telescopes. Uh, but the ASV also does classes so that you can learn about astronomy. And the next slide, please, Mark. How to read charts, but also how to learn to use your telescope. So if you're a member of the ASV and you can find the details about how to join the society on our face uh, sorry on our website then you can join some of these classes and grow your knowledge of astronomy telescopes and how to use them thanks mark first of all telescopes basically do the same thing as what guitar amplifiers do for sound, telescopes do it for light. So as you can see in this particular picture, this is the traditional setup for a telescope. You've got a lens that gathers the light at the front, then the light is bent and it goes to a second lens at the back and there, it's turned upside down. So if you've got a telescope and it's showing you things upside down, don't take it back to the store. This is exactly what astronomical telescopes are supposed to do because in space, every wave can be up. 
but you can get erecting eyepieces, which will uh, change the view, but it's not really necessary, and most astronomers don't go anywhere near those type of eyepieces. Next slide, please, Mark. There you go. All right, so there you can see the top one shows that design put inside a solid tube. So the light enters from the left and ends up at the eyepiece at the back on the right. So that's a refracting telescope where light is refracted as it passes through the lenses, the glass lenses. The second one below that is a reflecting telescope. It's an open tube, light enters from the left, goes to a mirror, a curved mirror at the right there, which reflects the light back up the tube to a little diagonal mirror, which pushes it out of the side of the telescope to the eyepiece. And the bottom one, a catadioptric telescope, is basically a combination of those two with a, a lens at the front, corrector plate, and a perforated mirror at the back, and the light journeys to a mirror near the front, pushed all the way back through the hole in the main mirror, and you observe from the back. Next slide, please, Mark. Now, a telescope tube on its own isn't much good. You need something to mount it on to keep it steady so it doesn't wobble and to use it to move the telescope through the sky. The first one, I'm not sure... Mark, is that picture able to be made any larger for the people? I'll try my best. That's there we go. Yes, that's good. Okay. So the one on the left is supposedly the best type of mounting because the logic behind it is that it follows the stars as they move through the sky. In fact, it's not the stars moving, it's the Earth rotating, and that mounting counteracts the rotation of the Earth. The middle one is just, sorry, the next one to the right of that, the alt azimuth mount is the simplest type that you can get. It just goes up and down and around, doesn't follow anything. And the one next to that, a fork mount, is more like the equatorial mount and the final one to the right has a stubby or fat tube if you like and wood makes up a sort of a rocker box that holds the tube of the telescope and that was first made by a gentleman called john dobson who used to be a monk and in the 1950s he came up with this idea of being able to use very cheap materials to make a really good solid mounting. And ever since then, it's been called the Dobsonian mount, or when you hear the term Dobsonian telescope, that's what it means. Next slide, please, Mark. Now, there's a lot of wrong scopes to begin with. You can make many mistakes, and it doesn't mean that these telescopes here are bad telescopes. A couple of them are okay, but they're not the first telescope that you should get. Next slide, please. Now, again, Mark, can we make them any larger? Ooh, you don't want much, do you? There we go. I'm a very demanding taskmaster, Mark. You are. I know you like the lash, so we're getting there. <laughs> um, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be frank here. I'm going to tell you the truth about these telescopes. 
Um, and really, some people may see me just like Billie Eilish does and says I'm the bad guy, but it's just really the truth. So avoid telescopes that are too small, too cheap, because they'll just end up having plastic lenses, as in this particular case, they won't have glass lenses, or they'll be complicated to use. Avoid telescopes that take too long to set up, that have a limited set of targets that you can see to any satisfaction. Uh, they will have unsteady mounts and they're to be avoided. Some will not have a finder scope to get you to your target. And occasionally at the other end, you may get a telescope which is just too large to begin with. But this telescope right here, please avoid that. Next. Ooh. And with this one as well, the mirror, even though it says National Geographic, the mirror in this telescope, which is a three inch, is not large enough to give you great views of anything more than perhaps the moon and a couple of planets. Keep going, Mark. And this might be just a bit too complicated for a beginner. Next. Just avoid this one. Just a bit too small. Next. Look at this telescope. It doesn't even have a finder scope. How are you going to target it at the neighbor's bathroom window? I'm just joking there, ladies and gentlemen. Don't ever do that. Let's you are a troublemaker. <laughs> and this one is just a slightly more expensive version of the previous one. It's got a finder scope, but don't buy this one. Next. Or this and one. Not this one either. Look at that flimsy tripod. In fact, Tripods in the beginning, especially with equatorial mounts on them that are made to a price are just not worth spending your money on. Keep going, Mark. And the same with this one. Even though it says that you can put your phone on the back of it and get a mirror, I'm not sure whether that means you get a a bracket to hold the telescope, whether you have to pay extra for it. But look, it's to be avoided nevertheless. Next one. Are we yep. getting closer, Perry? We are. We're getting sort getting of there. Huh? And the next, void this one. And much the same thing, just a slightly high amount, still a little bit too small. Keep going. Oh, look, if you know who Usain Bolt is and you're <laughs> in a shop and a salesman is trying to sell you that telescope, get there faster than Usain Bolt doing the 100 metres of the Olympics. Next one, please. Oh, that's a bit small. Let's make that That is a bit small. Yep. There we go. Even though it says Sky Watcher or even some of them will say Celestron or Mead or even Saxon, um, the truth is that all of these reputable companies also make smaller telescopes to a price that are made very, very cheaply and you can't, well, they're done really for one purpose. and that make is money. I didn't say that, but now that Mark has said it, we'll go with it. Next you know one. it's true. Oh, again, no finder scope. Let's keep going. Oh. The same thing with just some extensions to the back, some trying to get more magnification out of it. Keep going, Mark. Yep, avoid this one as well. It'll be complicated to use anyway. Keep going, but it's a bit too small. Same with this one. Keep going, Mark. 
And yes, look, it might look terrific and cool, but it doesn't give you much in the way of bang for your buck. Yeah, but Gary, Gary, it says Sir Isaac Newton on it. Surely it's got to be good. Um, do you think he actually made that one, Mark? People if he might. did, it might be worth <laughs> buying because it'll be a bargain. I know. Let's so keep going. A slightly bigger version of the Sir Isaac Newton telescope, but still not much chop. Keep going. Oh, this is just like the first one. Junk. Keep going. And this, even though it says National Geogra Geographic and it's got the constellations on the outside, and you might think it looks cool. I think you can spend your money better than that one. Next one. Please. Okay. And I, I believe uh, my parents have got one of these, Perry. Who does? My parents. And I have tried to use it before, and it's not fun. Yes. Well, I'm glad we've got a testimonial here mm -hmm. from a real user, so I don't need to say any more. Next one, please, Mark. I love this picture. Blow it up a little bit. <laughs> this is good. Where did you find this? Because this picture is on the outside of the box of this little telescope. And I don't know how they think we're ever going to see the Earth like that through this telescope, but that's kind of what it's hinting at. But look, there is nothing that should ever make you spend money on this particular telescope. One to avoid. Keep going, Mark. And don't feel patriotic because it's got an Australian flag and a map of Australia on there. It's still a telescope to be avoided. Next, Mark. And the same with this one. Let's keep going. And that one, and this one. So let's go to the next slide. Oh. Just blow that up a little bit. Oh. Most of the ones that I've said to avoid have been too small. This one is at the other end of the scale. Don't buy a telescope that's just plainly too large for you as your first telescope. It may give fantastic views, but don't do it. Next. I, I love his enthusiasm, Perry. Yes. You've got it. Next Oop. one. Hang on a second. We'll move down to the next one. And don't buy anything as big as this either, even though Rob McNaught, noted uh, comet discoverer of Comet McNaught, uses this all the time it's not for beginners to use no. next one it's just too big and blow this up a little bit mark this Whoa. is really too large <laughs> a telescope to begin with don't start with that one now let's see yep. what the asv recommends let's blow it up a little bit yeah mark. let's make this a bit bigger shall we there we go now, it doesn't look much like a traditional telescope because it's a reflector and it's on a Dobsonian mount, but it's got, it's got all the good things. Mark, can you point out the finder scope? Yeah. I hope you can see my crosshair, the crosshair on that. It's very small. Yep, up at the top there. Now... Down the, the tube has an opening at the top, which Mark will point out. Light enters that tube. It goes all the way down to the bottom and at the other end, if you can show the other end, Mark. Yeah, the they're already. Um, that's where the mirror is. The mirror is the heart of the telescope, certainly a reflecting telescope. And it reflects the light back up to another little mirror 
so which pushes it out of the side to there where Mark is pointing and the eyepiece fits in for you to observe the object. Now, we do not recommend a telescope with a mirror that's smaller than an eight inch if you're serious about getting into astronomy as a beginner. Next slide, please. This one's a Saxon telescope. This one here is an Apertura telescope. It was voted uh, 2020's telescope of the year, but you can see it's much the same sort of design. It's an eight inch Dobsonian. There's the tube, it's got a finder on top. There's the mount which uh, John Dobson first designed. Next one, please. Might blow that up a little bit. Yeah, this so this is, is, this is the one Blake's got. This is his well, first telescope when he was eight. Now. Yes. Again, it does, the brand of them doesn't matter very much because, well, seriously, folks, between us and you, we kind of think all of these Dob telescopes are made in the same factory in China with just different names on the brands of the outside of the telescope with some minor differences. But again, just a regular 8-inch Dobsonian telescope. Next, please, Mark. Oh, I'll blow that one up as well. Yep, this is a, a SkyQuest, which is made by Orion. Again, an 8-inch, and you can see the type of mounting and the tube, which is basically a Newtonian reflector. And the next, Mark. Just zoom it in a little bit more. Now, these telescopes, and uh, again, this is a Saxon. It's no better or no worse than any of the other ones. And we suggest buy one that you find the best deal on, really. These telescopes should cost somewhere between about $600 to $650 maybe 700 tops. Don't spend any more than that. Go to the next, please. And zoom it up a little bit more. But these telescopes come with two eyepieces and a finder scope, and that is all you need. You're ready to go once you've got that much. Now, if you look at those two eyepieces, the larger one of the two uh, is the one to always begin your observing with because it gives you a wider field of view and makes it easier for you to find your target. The other one is for magnification that's a little bit higher, but only use that after you've found your target. Through one of these eight inch telescopes, you will see the craters, mountains, valleys, and mare, or what are called seas on the moon. You will see Jupiter, its cloud bands, and its satellites, the four Galilean moons. You will see the rings of Saturn and some of its moons. You will also see Mars, Mercury, Venus, all the planets, in fact. But you will also see some good clusters of stars. And if you take it to a dark sky site, like the one that the Astronomical Society of Victoria has, but unfortunately, during COVID, we cannot travel there, you will see some wonderful globular clusters, nebulae, and some galaxies through this telescope. In fact, you will probably never run out of objects to see. However, if you stay in astronomy, it will probably not be the last telescope that you will use. For starters, you want to make, you might want to go larger. 
that's called aperture fever. Most of us have got it, but we know the, an the antidote for it. That's the ASV's 40-inch telescope. Um, also, you may want to go into astrophotography. These telescopes are not really designed for astrophotography, although I know Mark and his son have taken some good pictures. How do you do it, Mark? Oh, I've been, I've been practising for five years, so I use an 8-inch Dobsonian like this and I use my dodgy little cracked screen iPhone 6S and I take uh, mainly photos of the moon, which you can do quite easily holding it by hand up to the eyepiece. But I've also been getting better at taking images of um, Saturn and, and Jupiter with my phone uh, through handheld to the eyepiece with one of these 8-inch Dobsonians. So with, with practice, it, it, it can be done. Fantastic. Um, so my advice is if you can't quite afford that much money, $600 to $700, don't buy one of those cheap ones. You will be disappointed. Um, in fact, uh, what you should get, go to the next slide, please, Mark. There we go. Get some binoculars, 7 by 50s are what we recommend. Again, the brand isn't that important. Make sure it's one of the reputable brands, though, like uh, Bintel, Saxon, um, Mead, Celestron, whatever. Um, and you can find many uses for these, and they're very easy to use. Next slide, please, Mark. Yeah. But once again, don't spend more than about $100, $150 tops. And you can not only use this in the sky, you can also take them down to the beach for the yacht races. You can take them to the football, the cricket, bird watching, anything. You may even want to take them to your next ballistic missile launch. Next slide, please, Mark. Now, just quickly, Perry, while so, we've got our good friend up, we've actually yeah. just been this afternoon, we've got a new raffle that's going to go live tomorrow because we just this afternoon received an email from Saxon uh, to say that they've got a pair of 10 by 50 uh, oceanfront binoculars that they're going to allow us to raffle off as another raffle, which will go live tomorrow for people. Great binoculars. Hardly, oh, sorry, heartily recommend them. And uh, thank you very much, Saxon, for your generosity. And along with the other companies, uh, Optic Central, Sky and Telescope, and who was the other one? Sidereal Trading as well. Sidereal Trading, yes. Thank you, Paul and Diego, for their generosity. Um, and when you've got, the, if, if you can't afford even $150 for binoculars, then join the ASB because we loan out eight inch Dobsonian telescopes. We've got a huge fleet of them. We loan them out to new members and then you can take them up to our dark sky site and use them. Next slide, please, Mark. There we go with the wonderful Milky Way and all the stars that you can see up there and thanks to Tim Brutton for that image. So that's our talk on telescopes and what to buy. So remember, 8-inch Dobsonian, don't spend more than about $700 tops. Wonderful. Now... We've got some have we got any we've got some people asking questions how do they work in backyard suburbia with light pollution well it doesn't matter what instrument you have in the backyard with light pollution it won't work quite as well as taking it out to a dark sky site however whatever you're able to see with your telescope in uh, in Melbourne, say, or a light polluted backyard somewhere, if it's an eight inch and you take it to a dark sky site, it's like having a 16 inch in your backyard. 
So we've also so, got one. We've also got a question asking: Do you need a trailer to transport them? Um, not really. Most of them will fit on the back seat of a car, in a boot, station wagon, hatchback. Yeah. Okay. And let's see. I think Any uh, that might. I think that might be it for now. Oh, when does the star stuff happen? Brad, Brady, seventy-seven. The star stuff will happen. Planets and Galaxies is tomorrow night. Uh, later on, oh, sorry, Galaxies and Nebula are tomorrow night. And later on tonight, after we've done a Sky for the Night tour through Starry Nights application, uh, we're hoping to have some clear skies out in the rural areas where we can look at some of the planets tonight. So, um, Perry, did you want to get Starry Nights loaded and ready to go? Yes. Now, you may have to. I can see it. they're ready to go. Just make sure you've got it open. and. There we are. Is okay. It, can you see it? Yep, up on the screen. To do your little, view, your little view trick. You can make it full screen again like we did earlier. Yep, we'll do that in a moment. I'll just let my cat in for a moment and explain <laughs> a few things. Okay, Jove the cat is in. Now... What you can see here, everybody, is the starry sky. Down here, of course, is the Earth, and that's our horizon. In this planetarium program, up here we have some of the details, like the time, the date, and the year, and we have a lot of controls. For example, we can change the time, we can go to sunset and it will look different. There's the western sky at sunset. We can travel around to the north. We can go to the east and have a look at what's happening there. In fact, we can go all around the sky. We can even go to the zenith, which is the point directly above your head. And currently there, we have the Moon, Jupiter, and Saturn. But if we go back to the Western sky, at about sunset, we can have a little bit of a tour at what's going on. How long will we have, Mark? Can you hear me, Mark? Sorry, let's do about 20 minutes worth and then we might pause and, and just quickly do the raffle and then come back because uh, okay. some people are expecting the, uh, the raffle uh, at about 8.25, 8.30. No worries. So what we will do is we'll make it a whole screen and what we've been talking about recently in the sky is the planet Mercury and Spica, the brightest star in Virgo. And as the sky gets darker, as time advances, you will see that more stars become visible, the sun sets, and everything moves towards the west. Now, these two bodies here, that's Spica, the brightest star in Virgo, and this is Mercury. A couple of nights ago, they were much closer together. Have a look. That was yesterday. Oops, sorry. That was yesterday. That was the night before and the night before that, when they were almost touching each other. But if we go back to today and zoom in, let's center it. We can have a look at what Mercury looks like a little bit closer. And it may surprise some of you. because it looks a lot like the moon. 
marked by collisions and craters. So a lot of small bodies, asteroids, space junk have hit this planet over billions of years and created this topography. So if we zoom out, you can also see that it looks like a bit like a gibbous moon because it's in an inside orbit from the Earth towards the sun. Let's go back to where we were and a bit higher up, we've got the wonderful constellation of Scorpius. The head of the scorpion is made up of these stars. Then the body of the scorpion goes through Antares and the tail winds up here with the stinger right there. And not too far from Scorpius, the scorpion, we have the moon right here. We can zoom in to have a look at it. There it is. There's the slightly more than uh, first quarter moon. And these areas, which are a little bit flatter than all the hilius areas here, are vast plains of basalt. This one is uh, the Sea of Serenity, Mare Serenitatis. Here is the Sea of Tranquility, which is where we first landed with Apollo 11 on the moon, the Sea of Crises, um, and the Sea of Fecundity, and the Sea of Nectar. But where exactly did we land? Well, approximately there on the moon is where we landed. But I want to show you one of my favorite craters on the moon because it uh, move. There it is. This crater here is called Messier. And Messier was a French astronomer that was into discovering comets. And you can see there's a bit of a trail like a comet tail behind it. And it looks terrific in the first few days of the new moon. So something to look out for. If we zoom out, nearby is Jupiter. And we can center on Jupiter. And what, by the way, what I showed you before on the moon, you will actually have better views of the moon through that eight-inch Dobsonian telescope than what I just showed you then. But let's go in on Jupiter. And with binoculars, you may be able to see Jupiter like that. And with four little stars, three on one side and one on the other, right next to it tonight. They're the same moons that Galileo first saw on Jupiter back in January 1610 when he turned his telescope up to Jupiter for the very first time. Now, Galileo didn't, did, didn't uh, make the first telescope. It, that was a chap called Hans Lepershey. But Galileo did improve the telescope and his design was slightly better. So that's what he could see. He couldn't see much more detail than what we've got there. But your telescope, the 8-inch Dobsonian, will give you a view of Jupiter and its planet and its moons that looks a bit like that. 
So you can see the moons will be in a straight line and you can even see some regions on the moon that look like two equatorial lines. Well, they are actually clouds on Jupiter. We call them his equatorial belt. And with a little bit more magnification, if you go in and you've got a good steady night of seeing, you may be able to get a view like that. And there's the great red spot. Now, I'll zoom out a little bit to show you something else. Those four moons that we have here, like Eo, which is the moon closest to Jupiter and is a very volcanic moon, uh, Europa is covered with a five or eight kilometer shelf of ice all the way, but underneath that, there is a great salty ocean and life may exist under the ice. This is Ganymede, the largest moon in the solar system, and this is Callisto. Now, tomorrow night, those moons will look like this. And the night after that, they will look like that. And after that, they will be as you see them there, with one of them transiting across the front of the planet. There it is, right there. Eo is going across the front of Jupiter. So each night, there is a different aspect to Jupiter and its moons. But here's how they are tonight. Should there be a cloud break and the rain stops, this is what you're likely to see with your 8-inch telescope. Now, if we zoom out some more, I said Saturn was also nearby. And here it is. We'll center it. And have a look. Here we go. Zoom in. And this is the sort of view that you can expect with an eight inch telescope. If you used your highest magnification, perhaps more like that, and you can see the beautiful rings. But if you've got the Hubble Space Telescope in your back pocket, you're more likely to see it like that, which is a magnificent thing to look at. Now, those rings are about 280,000 kilometers in diameter. But one of the most unusual things about those rings is that even though they stretch for so far, they are not very thick. They are quite thin. In fact, every 13 years or so, they manage to turn side on because of the geometry between Saturn, the Earth, and the Sun. And even with a good telescope, you may not be able to see them because they will be edge on. And when they're edge on, the thickness of them is somewhere between 100 to 200 metres, which is not very much at all. So next year at this time, the rings will change slightly. Oops, let's go back. Um, that's how it will look next year. The rings begin to close. They're closing up. And finally, they will get on edge. 
and they will be very difficult to view from the earth. Let's go back to where we were tonight. Let me just check that we've come back to the right year. Time travel is such a bugger. No. Not if you've got a DeLorean. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Um, let's set the controls for one less year. Here we are back to 2020. Um, all right, let's zoom back out from here. By the way, these are some of the moons of Saturn. This is Titan the only moon that has an atmosphere and the only moon on which we've landed a probe. And we managed to get only one photograph from the surface before it all went horribly wrong. But never mind. There's Tethys, another moon, Enceladus, Dione, Rhea, and this is not a moon at all. It's just masquerading as a moon. It's a distant star. Okay, let's zoom back out. Because the other planet worth looking at in the sky at the moment rises about eight o'clock in the evening, and we need to be looking at the eastern sky. So let's have a look towards the eastern sky and advance the time, you will see all of these stars rising higher, much like what the sun does because the earth turns towards the east. It rotates continuously. Here we are. And there's Mars. It comes over the horizon well, that says two minutes after eight. So by about 8.30, even if you have uh, don't have a clear view to the eastern horizon, hopefully it won't take too long to rise above them. And by around 9.30, 10 in the evening, it's a lot higher. Let's have a look at Mars. Let's center it and have a bit of a closer look. And not only have we got Mars, and by the way, Mars with an eight inch telescope will look a bit like that at lowest magnification, if you up the magnification, maybe a bit like that. And not only do we have Mars, we also have Phobos and Deimos. It's two moons. Now, if we zoom in some more, what we can see on Mars here is the largest volcano in the solar system, which is called Olympus Mons. And there it is. Up here is Valles Marineris, which is, I'll have to roll time backwards for us to be able to have a better look at Valles Marineris which is about the distance from here to here is about the distance from Melbourne, perhaps, to Darwin. So it's quite a large canyon. And it makes the Grand Canyon in the USA appear like the not-so-grand canyon. But, yes, Mars rotates almost uh, 
at the same 24-hour period as Earth. It's just a, a little bit longer than Earth's, but very similar. And not only does Mars rotate, but if we go back, oh, damn. Sorry about that. You can see its moons orbiting, but if we zoom into these, we can actually see them rotating as well. How are we going for time, Mark? I think uh, we might pause it here for a moment and go and do our, our lovely little raffle. Um, right. So if you just want to leave it, leave your screen there it is, as it is, I'll... Um... Let, let me just show the rotation. And yeah, show the rotation while I get myself ready for drawing the raffle. Okay. Now, oh, you can oh, We need the... to go to yours, sorry. <laughs> there we go. There's the Difficult rotation. difficulties, apologies. Hope everybody could see that rotation and I'll zoom back out. But you may see that this doesn't look spherical like our moon does that's because both of these are tiny they're only about uh, 10 or 11 kilometers across that's for phobos deimos is even smaller and they're in fact captured asteroids from the asteroid belt or so we believe so I'll leave it there for the moment, Mark, and you can take over. Okay, so... Do I need to do anything else? No, I'm just going to be mean and nasty, Perry, and I'm going to mute you for the moment, and I'll, uh, I'll bring you back in a second. All right, so some of you may have uh, bought a ticket to the first raffle, which was uh, a pair of binoculars. Uh, where are we now? Get the right one, hey? Hang on a second. Here we go. Let's put that up, shall we? The Optic Central Binoculars Raffle is the first one. And uh, I'm going to click the spin button and let's see who's won this one, shall we? Peter, hey. Okay, Peter, we will uh, contact you via email and uh, get your details and send you out the lovely pair of binoculars. Now, for uh, those of you who weren't in that raffle, we do have another pair of binoculars that today were donated by Saxon that we'll be putting up for a, a raffle tomorrow. Uh, that'll be limited to 240 tickets. Uh, so as soon as it keeps an eye, keep an eye on our Facebook page, and as soon as it goes live, jump through and, and purchase your tickets. All right. So we might just wait for Perry to come back. It looks like he's gone to feed his cat, guys. So let's have a look and see what we've got in the comment section here. Ah, oh, someone says, "Hey, Peter, you won." Mandy, I'm assuming you must know Peter. Uh, Arno, there are more tickets coming tomorrow for a new set of binoculars. Um, so um, we'll put that link up tomorrow uh, and that'll be for a pair of Saxon binoculars. These ones for, were Optic Central, donated by Optic Central. Thank you very much, uh, Optic Central. I should say thank you very much, Bill. I can see you commenting. Congratulations there. Um, so let's go back, Perry, to your street, your sky for the night for a little bit while we wait to see if the sky clears for Andy and Noel. So we can have a look at uh, some planets. So stick around guys, because we are hopefully, if we've got some clear skies out where Andy and, and Noel are, we will be able to have a look at Jupiter and Saturn and maybe Neptune uh, as well. And if it gets a little bit later um, and Mars rises enough, Andy might be able to get Mars in the scope for us as well. All yours again, Perry.
sorry, Perry, you were muted there. Go for it. Ah, can you see my screen, Mark? Yes, we can. We can all see your screen. Excellent. Okay, let's go back to the western sky, the round sunset, which these days occurs about 20 minutes past six. And if we go a little bit higher, let's check out some of the interesting stars. And by the way, everybody, whenever you're beginning to look for uh, things in the sky, soon after sunset is a very good time to begin because there are not so many stars in the sky, only the brightest ones. When you get a lot of stars in the sky, it can get a little bit confusing. So soon after sunset is a good time to begin because only the first magnitude stars, in other words, the brightest 20, are visible. And that will help you to find your way across the sky. So currently in the West, the brightest first magnitude star is this one called Antares. And its name means instead of Mars, because it rivals Mars with its color, which is a little bit orange red, just like Mars is. Now, let's advance the time a little bit. Oh, and by the way, we can do some interesting things with this program, which is called Starry Night. You may be able to see this line of stars. They're the head of the scorpion. The body of the scorpion goes backwards through Antares at its heart and the tail winds up here. But when there's a lot of stars to be seen, as in, let's say, let me centre Antares. When it gets darker, there's a lot more stars to be seen and all of a sudden the shape kind of gets a little bit lost. So remember, always begin soon after sunset because the sky isn't so complicated then. Nevertheless, in this program, you can bring up the illustrations, the old fashioned ones that used to be around hundreds of years ago, they don't really help that much. Um, let's get rid of them and let's put in these ones, which are a little bit more like the objects. There you go. There's the scorpion, uh, head, body, and tail. But if you learn your way around the sky, and many of us have, then you don't need any of those, and you can just find your way across the sky, a little bit like going from home and walking to the nearest supermarket. But only one of you, and only before nine o'clock, and only once a day. So, Antares is a very interesting star because it's a red supergiant. In fact, it is so large that if we were to take the sun out of the center of our solar system, and replace it with another sun, this particular sun, Antares. And by the way, just in case it's not clear, the sun is a star 
and stars are suns, some larger, some smaller, but that's what the sun is, a star. So if we replace the sun with Antares, then Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars will all be orbiting inside Antares. That is how large that particular star is. So it is a bit of a whopper. Now, from the western sky, let's head to the northern sky because there's three first magnitude stars. And again, I'll go to full screen and these stars are a little bit difficult to identify later in the evening, but if you do it early in the evening, and I'll go backwards in time when there's not as many stars, here is this triangle, which in the Northern Hemisphere, where at this time of year, or during the summertime, these three stars are high in their sky and they make a triangle and they call it the Northern Triangle. It's an asterism, it's not a recognised constellation, but this is Altair, Deneb is in the constellation of Cygnus, the Swan, Altair is in Aquila, the Eagle, and this one here is Vega in the constellation Lyra, the Lyre. Uh, not the Lyre as in uh, someone telling you a fib, but Lyre as in the musical instrument that was played by the Greek god Apollo. And these two stars in particular, but also Deneb, uh, well-known science fiction stars. If you're a fan of science fiction, then you may have heard of these stars before. For example, this one, Vega, is the star that Jodie Foster travelled to in the wonderful film Contact, which was based on a book written by the magnificent astronomer Carl Sagan, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Um, so that is Vega. It's about 25 light years from us, but it's low in the, in the northern sky. Up here, Altair, which is a little bit higher up. I'll zoom in a little bit more. So you can see it better in the constellation of Aquila. Well, Altair features as the destination in that classy 1950s science fiction flick called Forbidden Planet that featured a totally electronic soundtrack and Robbie, Robbie the Robot. So that's where they were for that one. Now, we're in the northern sky, and of course, we know it's the northern sky because there's a little M down at the bottom here, and we don't lose our way. Deneb is very low. It never gets high or very high at all because it's basically a northern hemisphere star. But if we advance the time, we can see it reaches its highest point due north at, let's have a look at the time, tonight at about quarter to nine, which is almost now in the next few minutes. So knowing that, 
let me show you some interesting objects around these stars. Now, these stars here make up the constellation of Lyra, the Lyre, and between these two stars, Beta and Gamma, Lyrae, right in the middle of them, is a very interesting object. We'll center it and we'll go in for a closer look. Here we go, a journey to the stars. Now it's starting to get there, I can see it. Keep your mind on it right here. We're getting closer right there. And this is the sort of look you will get of it from an eight inch telescope. You won't see the color because the colors are usually an artifact of photography and the CCD cameras that are used for that but you will see it as a heavenly smoke ring. Now, if you've got more magnification, a slightly bigger telescope, you may see that. And if you can get to use the Hubble Space Telescope, you might see that. Let me... Perry, I just wanted to jump sure, in quickly if I can. Um... Noel has just let me know it is crystal clear up in Bendigo and he's just in the process of setting his rig up. So we will be able to live stream some of the planets shortly. Uh, and we have, uh, Andy says it's clearing up Sorry. in a few minutes where he is as well, um, out near the South Australian border in, in rural Victoria where he is. So um, I think in about okay. 10 I'll minutes we should be ready to watch. some of this quickly. Yep. Um, this is called no a planetary nebula even though it has no relationship with planets whatsoever. It's a misnomer, it's a name that has stuck, but it really doesn't mean anything to do with planets. But what's happened is, once upon a time, this star in the middle here was like the sun, but it reached the end of its life. And stars like the sun don't go supernova, but they push out the layers of their atmosphere and become giants and then they push out even further and send them into space. So this is that material that's been pushed out at the end of the life of that particular star. So this is the Ring Nebula and quite an interesting object to look at from a dark sky. A little bit higher up where Altair is, two interesting things. Right here in the middle is a beautiful little group of stars called the Coat Hanger. Whenever I'm doing this live and people uh, using binoculars, I ask them to tell me when they can see a coat hanger, and it's usually about now. There it is. If you've got a telescope, though, you can go further, and soon enough, the coat hanger shape kind of is lost a little bit. But not far from the coat hanger, is another beautiful object that you can see in an eight inch telescope. This is called the Dumbbell Nebula. It's another planetary nebula that was created at the end of the life of a star like the sun. And if we zoom in on that, some people call it the Apple Core Nebula. By the way, the word nebula is Latin for mist or cloud. And here we are, so there it is. And in the center of this as well is the progenitor star, which pushed out all of this material at the end of its life. So this is the dumbbell or apple core nebula. Um, 
I've got a little bit of time to show you two more things before we wind it up. And near the star Deneb, there was a star that didn't end its life like the previous two. This one was about 10 times the mass of the sun. So a very, very large star. And that one went supernova. So what that means is it runs out of fuel and can no longer sustain the pull of gravity towards the center of the star. And so uh, gravity wins and the star collapses in on the core of the center of the star and then rebounds in a huge and colossal explosion. So this is cataclysmic. And really, if you're in the region of about 100 light years of a star that goes supernova, you would be in a lot of trouble. Fortunately, Perry, yes, we have a question, but will we survive the increased brightness of the sun? No. No, I know, I know we won't. Can you explain why? Well, because the outer layers of the sun will grow to envelop the earth. So we will be inside the star and it will just be too hot. But we won't be around when it gets to that stage. Either we will long be extinct or we would have gotten off into a spaceship and zoomed off somewhere else. But sooner or later, we have to get off the Earth. We do. And we have another question. Can we see Orion? Um, we, can, have you shown Orion yet? No. Uh, you can see Orion very, very late in the evening. The best time to see Orion is late spring and through summer and early autumn. So maybe we, can do, maybe we can do this again in three months' time when we'll have a totally different sky and see what's up then. But let's go in and have a look, a closer look at what's left of this supernova. So which supernova are we looking at at the moment, Perry? This is the Veil Nebula. Oh, Veil Supernova. Okay. Okay. Yep. Now, there are, yes, there are two parts to it. This is the eastern side. This is the western side. And in the middle between them, there used to exist a very massive, bright star that exploded. And all that's left of it after it tore itself apart in the explosion is the, this bit of gas and dust. And unfortunately, we're not within 100 light years of a star that we're expecting to go supernova. There are no supernova candidates. But if there were, then the harmful rays from that particular explosion would basically have just exterminated, disinfected the earth of all living life. All living things would have been, uh, it would have sterilized the earth basically. So fortunately we're not near it, but I want to end up at the southern sky and these are the stars that we see all the time. They are circumpolar, which means they never set, for us at least in Melbourne. So here, again, it's difficult to see it, but if we roll the time back, we'll be able to see the pointers and the Southern Cross. So let's roll back time when it gets closer to sunset and there are fewer stars. And whammo, here's the Southern Cross on its side, excuse me. 
And the two pointers, Alpha and Beta Centauri, always pointing to that top star. No matter where they are in the sky, and they change their position because of the Earth's orbit and also its rotation. So if we advance the time again and you keep your mind on them, more stars will come to be seen. But the orientation of these two stars always pointing towards the top star of the cross is never lost. Let's advance the time. Perry, we've got some comments asking if we can look at the name that can't be said, Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice? Beetle geese. No, they, they want beetle juice. Uh, well, from the beetle movie, juice, they have, to go and, <laughs> beetle geese. they have to go and buy the movie from. Uh, I know. They, they're asking if we can look at beetle geese. Uh, yes, we'll do it straight after this and remind. Yep, there we go. Your wish has been granted, uh, Facebook fellow followers. Thank you. Um, these two things here are satellite galaxies of the Milky Way and they're called the Small and Large Magellanic Clouds. If we zoom in here, you can see them, by the way, as stray, stray pieces of the Milky Way from a dark sky site. Here's the smaller Magellanic Cloud. So it's a galaxy, but much smaller than the Milky Way. And so the Milky Way's gravity keeps it in orbit around the Milky Way, much like the Earth does with the Moon, except it takes many millions of years to complete an orbit. Now, if we zoom in at the large Magellanic Cloud, here was the last supernova that we could see with naked eye, and it occurred in 1987 so some of you may not have even been born i was two i think am i lying maybe um so you can see these from a dark sky site and in the northern hemisphere they can't see them they're too far south and they're called the magellanic clouds because when Magellan's ship from its circumnavigation of the Earth went back to Europe, it brought news of these things that they could see in the sky. Now, let's I'm, go. I'm going to be a party pooper, Perry. We have uh, Jupiter on screen ready to go. Let's Last okay, one. We'll go to Beetle Geese and we'll wind it up. So let's advance the time. You will see stars coming over the eastern horizon. Let's make it a bit quicker. Here we go. There's Orion has just risen. There's the Pleiades, Taurus. There's Orion. Let's center it. Orion is the saucepan, and there's two giant stars, super giant stars in Orion. One of them is Rigel, a blue super giant shining with 57,000 times the luminosity of the sun. And this one down here is Betelgeuse, which is a red super giant star. Now, we can't really get much closer to have a good close look at stars, no matter how large our telescope, unless we use an interferometer style thing, um, because they will just look like a very bright point, of, uh, point source of light because they are that distant from us. Perry? Yes. I've just seen a very interesting comment while we finish up to move to Jupiter. Yep. A lady by the name of Susan McKenna has just commented to say, great to see you, Perry. I used to live at the front of the house in Oron Crescent. Oh, hello, <laughs> Susan. 
<laughs> you and your brother Paul, is that correct? Well, we'll soon find out when she responds to that question. No, um, really. But now I'm going to um, stop your share there, Perry. Um, and I'll bring in Andy and Stuart, and we can uh, start having a look at uh, Jupiter. So can, I just thank, can I just thank everybody, Mark, for, yeah, go for it. Oops. giving me their attention on this? And look, if you have any more questions, you can always reach us via many sources uh, from our website, our Facebook pages, Twitter. Uh, some of us also have personal pages. Uh, but if you want to email us, go to our uh, to our website. Uh, if you want to get in touch with the social media team, you can do that via Facebook and other means. So thank you for your attention and good luck to Noel and Andy. Over to you, Mark. Last one, Perry, just quickly before you go. Uh, are we able to see Kepler's supernova through a telescope in the Southern Hemisphere? No, it's a Northern Hemisphere object. There you go. It's a Northern Hemisphere object. Okay. So, uh, Andy, you've got um, – well, before we do this, I uh, just wanted to introduce Stuart Beveridge. Stuart is the Section Director for Lunar and Planetary, which is uh, – so he's here tonight to help us uh, answer any questions you've got about the planets. Perry's going to stick around and answer some questions for us as well, and Andy will jump in if he needs to as well. Are you ready to go, Andy? Yeah, it's uh, there's a couple of clouds just coming through right now. Oh, let's just shall we jump to your stream? Yeah, we can jump straight in. in there. What we can yeah. yeah, it's just a. You must oh, assume in a bit. It's just you might have to bump it up a bit. Oh, look at that! The cloud has just spoiled the fun, hasn't it? Right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, just it's it's pretty. It's not really a planetary camera, but it, here we go. Oh, yeah. It's been a shocking night tonight. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> this is 2020 playing havoc. Somebody said Beetle, Beetle Geist. Sorry, Perry. Yeah. Beetle Geist three times, didn't they? Oh, here we go. Um, it is an Arabic name, so if anyone can speak oh. Arabic, they may be able to pronounce it much better than any one of us. Oh, I think what? it's something like Bet El Giz. It's, it's always embarrassing when your daughter's teacher says hello to you on, on the live stream. Mm -hmm. Hello, Lisa. Glad to see you've tuned in. Now, here we go. That's probably all I can really do. That's just a live view. I'll just have a quick poke my head out. <laughs> Two seconds. <laughs> Oh, so this is this is Jupiter. We've got a bit of cloud in the way by the looks of yeah, it. Yeah, look, it's, it's coming back in again, of course. Okay, so if you bear with us, everyone, we do have somebody yeah. else setting up their equipment at the moment. They're just trying to align at the moment, and okay. um, hopefully, we can um, keep it keep the stream going for you. Okay. Um, has anybody got any questions about Jupiter that they might like to ask? And while we're at that, while we're waiting, Stuart, have you got some facts about Jupiter you might be able to share with us? Here's a couple. Here's, here's one I did the other night. Okay, um, so this is an image from the other night of Jupiter using this same equipment. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just zoom in a bit. Um, yep. So, Stuart, have you got anything you'd like to let us know about Jupiter? Some fun, some interesting facts? Yeah, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can, yes, yes. Okay, so Jupiter, not to sound obvious for those who know, is the fifth planet from the sun and the largest in the solar system. It's a gas giant with a mass 1,000 that of the sun, but two and a half times that of the uh, other planets in the solar system combined. So it's quite large. Just let me... So has anybody got in in our lovely chat there? We've got lots of people saying, wow, and this is cool. But do you have any questions about Jupiter that you'd like to ask us that we might be able to answer for you? Let's... While we wait for that, I will check with, uh, see how our other camera is going and make sure that we can uh, see if we can get a, another view of, of Jupiter live in the night sky for you. Let's go back to my... 
Whoops, that's a steal. And that's Where a have you got a video, Andy, that you've taken of Jupiter while you're waiting for the clouds to, to yes, move away? That was a still. Oh, here yep. we go. This is a this, uh, sorry, a single image. Um, and this is a stack of a thousand frames. And then I, I probably chose about 400 of them. And, um, I, you know, I could do with a, another four times would be good like a four times power mate would be um probably the best but this is just a two times on a 150 mil newt oh there you go look there's my gear there we go there's your camera equipment you're using a zwo asi 120 mc camera using a skywatch yep. 150 mil newtonian telescope on a heq5 mount and the software you're using is sharp cat yeah so how many did you say a thousand images stacked yeah a thousand frames and it's it's running about um i'm getting between 30 frames a second so uh what's that 30 seconds yep so we'll be giving on the frames um, okay so we've got we've got some questions here um sorry Andy, we've got some questions here for stuart and perry might be able to answer these what type of gases is jupiter made of stuart do you want to answer that um a bit of hydrogen I hydrogen think. yeah yep yeah. what else have we got so we've got uh what are the two uh, ammonia yeah. there's a lot of ammonia you it all gas or has it got a solid liquid core it's metallic hydrogen i think it's a metallic it's actually hydrogen so dense that it becomes a metallic so it's almost metal. like a liquid metal, though, isn't it? Yeah, it's a liquid metal, but it's just, yeah. yeah so it's, it's not a so solid. It's, it's still a liquid. Yeah. Uh, was Jupiter considered a second sun? Now, I've heard this as well. Some people say no, it's essentially a no. ground dwarf, but, yeah. No, we go. it's too small. There's not enough mass in Jupiter to be able to do that. It would, Stuart, would it need to be about 20 times as massive, or is it more than that? I'm not too sure. I know it's not massive enough, Perry, to have been a, a, a sun or to have um, caused um, a nuclear fusion to, to take off as a sun. But, yeah, I, I don't know how many times too small it is, but it, um, it is quite still a very large object. I, I did watch something on this the other day, actually, and I believe they said it was 17 times too small. So if it was 17 times bigger, it would have considered to, to be a uh, failed star. Uh, I'm just going to oh, mute Andy there for a second. Sorry, guys. What is the surface of Jupiter like under its atmosphere? There is no surface. There you go. Yeah. There is no surface. It's uh, just, we have a, a question from a we have a question from a two year old. How fast is the red spot on Jupiter shrinking? Stuart. Well, it was it was shrinking um, up to last year, but it seems to have stopped shrinking now, and it's become stable again. So. Um, uh, uh also there was bits breaking off it and uh, seemingly uh, traveling around the um, equatorial belt but um yeah, it seems to do that every now and then and then stabilize but at the moment i don't believe it is shrinking all right so and then we've got another one how many moons does jupiter have not as many as saturn in the 70s i think Stuart, have you got the latest now, I'm just looking at that. I think you're about right, Perry. It's around in the 70s because I think Saturn is in the 90s from memory. Okay, what else have we got? Um, uh, no, we've had that. We've covered the Jupiter's great red spot. What is the, the significance of Jupiter's magnetic field? So what is the significance of Jupiter's magnetic field? Well, it can be seen from radio telescopes on the Earth, um, especially when IO I or EO is travelling around uh, to one side of it, and it looks like a, um, a giant induction electric motor. So um, when they fly spacecraft there, and they have in the past, like uh, the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, they had to be very careful that they didn't get too close 
otherwise it would have been fried because there were se several millions of amps flowing between Io, uh, Eo and Jupiter's um, outer atmosphere. So it's, it's quite a uh, significant electric field and can be seen detected on the Earth, probably detected from, at LMDSS. Okay, so we've got a live stream happening now from uh, one of our astrophotographers, Ron Roper, has uh, got his, his, he's got a view of Jupiter from Ringwood at the moment, Stuart, right near you. So this is a live yep. image of Jupiter from Ron's uh, house in uh, the Ringwood area. He's using a Celestron Edge HD 8-inch uh, telescope attached to a Celestron Alt as mount with a Zwo ASI 290MC camera. Uh, he's using fire capture as well. And you can ah. see that it's, this is video. Um, when we image the planets, we uh, do so in video to try and do, do what's known as lucky imaging. And lucky imaging means taking as many frames as possible and uh, trying to stack, trying to determine how many sharp ones are in those uh, collections of videos and stack them all together to get a, to get a sharper image because the, the atmosphere has a, a huge detrimental effect on planets. And it's because they're, they're quite small as well, quite mm. small now, objects. We've got another question. How hot is the temperature on Jupiter? It depends on where you are. If you're near the core, it would be quite hot, I would think. But up around the cloud tops, it probably would be free, would it not, Stuart? What have we got? Uh, oh, we have some team members that have commented on this one, and they said minus 145 degrees in the clouds of Jupiter. Near the planet center, it is much hotter, uh, around about uh, 24,000 degrees Celsius. Yeah, I think you need to uh, <laughs> to take Jupiter off your bucket list destinations for a holiday. Oh, if you want a tan, it's a good place to go. Um, for all the people that are watching it, Stuart just uh, mentioned it before, but I think it's worth pointing out that because the Earth's atmosphere is quite unsteady on many occasions, it stops... Especially tonight. It's, yeah. It stops us from getting the sharpest views possible. And the way to explain that is to think about um, being at the bottom of a pool. So your family's got a pool and you're at the bottom with goggles and you're looking up at the moon in the sky and someone is making waves in the water, they're splashing. Now you wouldn't get a good view of the moon, but if there's no splashing of waves through the water from the bottom of the swimming pool, then you would get a better view. And so we're at the bottom of the swimming pool filled with atmospheric gases. Now, um Ron, we've had a, a suggestion yes. uh, from someone asking if you can change the gamma settings to bring up some more contrast. Yeah, we'll see how we go. Yeah. There we go. It's Question answered, Andrew. Oh, how much larger is Jupiter's core compared to Earth's? It's, there's there's lots of clear going question. across the time. Yeah, so we're trying to deal with clouds as well, Andrew. So we're, do we're doing the best we can at the moment with the uh, lovely cloudy Melbourne weather at the moment. So we want someone's asking how how large is Jupiter's core compared to Earth's? Do we, have either of you boys got an answer on that one? Oh, and we have another one. Why are the bands different colours? Stuart? Different gases, perhaps? Yeah, I think it's just uh, different uh, types of gases. Um, we try and determine um, what type of gases are on Jupiter, especially um, uh, one of our uh, long-term members, Barry Adcock, by looking at various different wavelengths at Jupiter regularly, uh, especially through the infrared wavelengths. And um, there's a particular wavelength that we use um, 
uh, otherwise known as methane, which is a very narrow infrared band at around 889 nanometers, which will show up gases such, such as methane. Um, the Great Red Spot seems to have significant methane, uh, as does the, the moon Io, but the rest of Jupiter doesn't seem to have that much. Um, but at other wavelengths, we can try and determine uh, other chemicals, but as per w exactly which um, uh, chemical uh, combinations cause those colours, I'm not 100% uh, sure. I'd have to look that up. And go, and and use, go and use Google to, quickly. And in answer to the question of <laughs> Jupiter's core versus the Earth's core, I've not... Uh, this isn't my area of expertise, but let me just say this. We've never been able to see the core of Jupiter, so it's a theory, theoretical size, and we've not been able to see the core of Earth either. So again, it's been theorised by, by a number of different means, uh, being able to work it out. But I would think that Jupiter's core is larger than Earth's core. However, we can put it on the back burner and next happy, time... Happy to be proven wrong. Right. Now, we do have an interesting question. Um, awesome view, thank you. What's the Bortle scale of the sky on this site in Ringwood? So, guys, Ron, Stuart, you guys both live in that area. Well, I think it's probably... Bortle? Well, it actually well, I'm not sure exactly the percentage is about six. Would that be about right, six. Stuart? Yeah. Um, yeah, probably around there. Around a border six. So we're talking not very good. But it doesn't matter with the planets. The no, moon and the it. planets, it doesn't yeah. matter because they're bright enough no, to no. shine over the but, light pollution. All right, so the, the, yeah, light the pollution the moon's really really close to the yeah, the moon is very close, yeah. So we have a couple from Wanda. How does the image differ from what we would see through an eight-inch Dobsonian? That's pretty close to it. It, it is, isn't it? It's essentially yep. the sort of image that I would get with a single click with my phone right now. Um, perhaps yeah. it's better, but um, it's a fuzzy ball, really, with the, you see the patterns. It's yeah. probably... Um, when you're looking at it visually, it'd be a little, it'd be a bit crisper, isn't it, Perry? It really depends on the atmospheric seeing at any time. I mean, one night, one, yeah. one night you can barely see the bands, and the next night <laughs> oh, they can stand out, and you can see the red spot. It was really highly dependent on atmospheric seeing of the night. And the other night, was it a few nights ago, Stuart? It was, it was very clear, wasn't it? It was very good seeing conditions. Yep. yep. I've got, a, I've got so, a video here, Mark, which people might be interested to see. You like a video of, of it under good conditions, Ron. Yeah, well, it's a bit better. A couple of nights ago, it was a video. So you're seeing now what it's like live right now. Um, I've got a 60-second video to, have to show all of it just to see what it looked like live a couple of nights ago and then a, a stacked image without any processing and then one that's had a little bit of processing and see how we get the three stages to get a, a nice-looking image. So, um, well, so we had a question there. We had a question there about uh, atmospheric conditions and would wind direction matter in Victoria? And I think it's just wind in general, isn't it, Stuart? Well, I don't like it to be windy at all um, when I'm imaging because it blows my scope around and it causes uh, Jupiter to vibrate and um, blow around on the screen. So um, I generally look on the um, um, uh, Bureau of Meteorology weather maps, and uh, I try and do all my imaging when. We have a nice high pressure system with the centre as close as possible to Melbourne, which means we'll be in the um, eye of the high, no wind, and generally, um, but not always, good uh, atmospheric conditions. Mm. This image you're seeing at the moment, I've, um, I've actually got a, an alignment control on that's keeping it in the centre of this screen. If I switch that off, you'll see how it's really jumping around. Yeah, I'll switch it, looks it off not, now so you can see now that. So we've got, a, a question, we've got another question, guys. Um, how many days in Jupiter like in a year on Earth? So what is a Jupiter year? What is, what is Jupiter's transition around the sun compared to Earth's, I guess? 
about 11 years. Stuart? It's about 11, 11 years. years. Yeah. Well, Stuart, hang on, Stuart. Each day is about 10 hours. He, he's muted himself, and I don't think he realises. <laughs> Stuart, you are muted. Um, while you sort that out, and, um, we have another question. Um, oh, sorry, am I all right now? Well, now, so how long is a, a rotation for Jupiter? How many years compared oh, to a day? A revolution. Oh, like that. Perry was correct. Yeah, 11 years. Cool. There and we it go. rotates very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. One day on Jupiter is 10 hours. There we go. The rotation of Jupiter one day equals 10 hours on Earth. Um, uh, Vinay, yes, the four dots you see around the planet, they are the moons of Jupiter, yes. And Arvind, can we see, uh, can we use an eight inch Dobsonian telescope to see planets beyond Saturn? Well, yes, yes you yep. can. but you will uh, not see a lot of detail on them. No, mm. what, what you're seeing on my screen now, if you've still got that up there, um, yes, we do. A, video a couple of nights ago. Um, and you can see that the, the moon EO is just off to the left of the disk of the planet. Yeah, so we're, we're, so everyone who's list, look, listening in and watching this, where the cursor currently is, that little dot that you can see, that's was that IO, is it wrong? Yeah, that's right, it's IO, yeah, yes. That's IO, that's here. a shadow being cast. That's a shadow over so there. Where, where the cursor is now, that little shadow, that's the shadow of IO uh, as it gets ready to, it's going to transit, isn't it? Or is that transited? It is. It's transit. Yes, yeah, it's, it's on the way of finishing. Yeah, finishing transit. Yeah, there you right go. Right over there. So you can see that the, the clarity of the bands on Jupiter they are better on that night than they are tonight. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I go back to the uh, live live uh, image, the other way to think of that yeah. little shadow yeah. um, EO on Jupiter is that. EO is causing an eclipse to occur. So if you were on Jupiter, you would be seeing a solar eclipse because EO would be blocking the sun at that particular spot on Jupiter's clouds. So you're watching a solar eclipse on a, another planet. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And this is all done with not overly expensive equipment. This is, you know, it's, a, it's an only an eight-inch telescope I'm doing this with. So, um, do I'm, all I'm the moons cool. on Jupiter? Do all the moons on Jupiter orbit the same direction? The yeah, main ones do. Yeah. Uh, and Nilusha, no, we can't live on Jupiter. Not at all. Um, no, not not no. one percent. Not even point zero zero one percent. There is no way humans could survive on Jupiter. Now, we've got people asking questions about the rings around Jupiter. We can't see them with uh, our size telescopes. They're a little bit too tenuous and a bit too thin. I've not heard of anyone being able to see them. Um, Stuart, no, you know no. more? No. You can't see them with um, ground-based telescopes. Well, not amateur-sized ones anyway. Now, Ron, um, yeah. if you've got on Jupiter yes. at the moment, are you able to move Saturn by any chance? I can, yes. Can I, can I just yeah. show you these other two, a couple of stills first? Yeah. Um, I'll pop a couple more stills up and then we can move to Saturn. Just I'm just watching yeah. the time and mindful of the time. Yep, yeah, okay. Okay, and here's a... While you're doing that, we have a question. Why do the bands on Jupiter move in different directions around the body of Jupiter? This comes from an ASV member, and I know he's an ASV member. I'm just trying to get this onto the right screen. Stuart? Um, Some sort of Coriolis effect, maybe? There we go. We've been asked a question we can't answer. I definitely can't answer. Yeah. I'm not that I'm not that smart. We'll take it on notice and answer <laughs> it next time. No, they now. do definitely they do definitely rotate. Yeah, they do rotate speeds. in different directions and different speeds, but I, I'm they not do, sure. Yeah. No, I'm not sure. Uh, 
I can't answer that uh, without having to review my answer. All right, so we've got a question from Brent. How much more detail would we be able to see using the big telescope at the dark Ooh. sky, dark site? Not a lot more. Yeah, but it's, no. not, it's, it's not. It does, it, Jupiter, the planets, it, am I right, Perry, in saying the planets, it's, it's not a matter of a bigger telescope on the ground gives you a better image? It has a lot more to do with steadiness of the atmosphere. Yeah. The yeah. really large telescope at Heathcliff wasn't designed to be a planetary telescope. It was more for deep sky stuff like galaxies. Yeah. And so, I know, so I know the 25-inch um, up at uh, the Dark Sky site um, has a much better view of um, Jupiter than the 40-inch does, and, and, yeah. and I've experienced that firsthand. It does 40-inch doesn't make it any better. That's for sure. No, it's a, it's a, a far step ratio. It's like the 40 inches only running at f3.3. Mm. So you'd have to collimate it to perfection. And the mirror, the main mirror, would have to be cooled to exactly ambient before it would perform on the planets better than the 25 or mo even the 18. The 18 would probably win out most times. Yeah, it would. Yeah. So Tyler is asking if that dark spot is a planetary eclipse, and it is. It was Io uh, finishing its uh, transit of, of yeah, Jupiter. Yeah, Eo. It's Eo's shadow. Eo. Eo. I've got to say it right. Yeah. Um, uh, Stuart, you're I think on our screen at the moment. I'm sorry, you're talking. Sorry, I was just going to say that Stuart's big refractor is probably a really good planetary telescope. It is, and that's a, a heck of a telescope, that. It is, um, but when I do my imaging, I use my 12-inch Newtonian, which I've kind of set up um, uh, dedicated for the planets. Okay. So, but, well, uh, yeah, no, visually, the um, my big refractor is definitely quite good. So, Ron, how are you going yeah. with getting um, Saturn in the view there? Yeah, I'll get it in a second. Um, just the image is up there at the moment. That's, no, that's, that's okay. That's a that's a stacked image of the uh, of a video that I took the other night. So that's that's the second stage of the processing that yeah, I do. How many stacks did you do with this image? Okay, I did a sixty second video, and that was about nine thousand frames, and I did twenty five percent. So it's probably you know I don't know um, two to three thousand frames in that image, um, all stacked together. But that's without any sharpening. And then when we do the next stage where it's sharpened a little bit. Um, oops, hang on, I'm on the wrong page, wrong screen. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Um, just go back, start again. There we are. Um, okay, so there's an image that had a bit of sharpening done to it. So you can see you start to get a bit more clarity around the bands and the storms within the clouds. Um, and that just gives people a bit of an idea where we start from, from the, the, the jittery videos and blurry first images through to a bit sharper so, so I'll, I'll come back. yes I've got a question here the ASI 290 MC is a monochrome camera do you also have a filter wheel and take filtered images in the stack and com composite to obtain the colored images no well I don't know the MC is a one-shot color camera um, yeah the yeah, MC is color yeah yep. so it just takes uh, color um, all three colors at once um, so I don't have to use a filter wheel on it. I haven't got a filter wheel. Uh, and Andrew is asking what program you sharpen with. Well, I usually go through a couple of stages. I um, I run it through pit first to bring it down to uh, all about 400 pixels wide, so they're all the same size. And then I run it through auto stack it three to stack it. And the image that you're looking at the moment there on the screen is actually through sharpened in auto stack it. But usually to get a look bit, a bit better sharpening, I go into um, Registax and do sharpening in that one, which generally gives you slightly better results. Yeah, I've got a couple of others. There's an image there of that same night with that moon. Uh, the there shadow you go there for those of you looking at the shadow before of EO. We'll get it yep. right. I will learn. There's another one. Uh, so between, between those two, they've moved a little bit. Um, I've got a bit of dust on the sensor there too. How are, we going with, how are we going with uh, Saturn there? Well, let's have a look. 
I told it to go there, but I bet it won't be looking at it. I'll we'll probably have to do a bit of a search. That's okay. Let, let's, so let's see just, if we Just talk amongst that. yourself. Talk amongst yourself so for a few minutes while I find it. Questions here. Um, what program? Oh, we've asked that. We've gone for that one. Brings back memories from my youth attending the observatory in Sydney 50 odd years ago. Wow, there we go. Uh, how much, now we've we've gone that. How long would it take to travel to Jupiter from Earth? What are you driving in? A <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. So let's let's assume light speed. Oh, here we go. <laughs> uh, light speed. I think is it about forty minutes, Stuart, or thirty minutes? Yeah, it's five astronomical units, so... Um, uh, he's doing his calculations, and while he's doing his calculations, Sam, yes, these images are taken... Uh, this Saturn image you can see right now is live-streamed from a telescope in the backyard of an ASV member from Ringwood. Granted, it's pretty fancy equipment compared to what uh, most of us astronomical plebs use. Um, but yes, this is from his backyard in Ringwood, live streamed. However, Dob will give you an image about as good as that. And on a night of really steady singing, it may even be a little bit better. You just blow oh, it up. I'll agree bit. with that. The, the other night, I'm Perry, in the backyard that. through the eight inch Dob, I had the best viewing of backyard suburban Melbourne. Uh, viewing of Jupiter and um, Saturn through an eight-inch Dobsonian that I've ever had uh, from from my backyard, it was it was pretty impressive. Those really steady nights are so far and few between that um, when I was working for somebody many many years ago, if it was a good night of steady seeing. I was getting ready to call in the morning and say I've got one of my migraines because I would have been out all night observing. Perry, that's why you go and work for yourself. That's why well, I, I work for myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what are Saturn's rings made of? The particles in the rings of Saturn vary in size from as small as uh, the particles in tobacco smoke, right up to things about the size of, uh, say, a, a small car. And they're composed of dust, rocks, and ice. There you go. So we've got another one. Can you, Perry, we, you, this, someone's missed your telescope talk. What is the best telescope for a beginner? The ASV recommends an 8-inch Dobsonian-style telescope. Um, you can get one of those for six to $700. Do not spend any more than that. If you can't afford it, don't get anything cheaper. You will be wasting your money and get binoculars instead. If you can't even afford to do that, Join the ASB because we loan out eight inch Dobsonian telescopes for three months at a time to new members. And they have half reasonable eyepieces as well. Half yeah, that's very, very reasonable eyepieces. Because some of those really cheap telescopes, the eyepieces are so bad that um, they're almost impossible to see through. They're very annoying. Now we had someone Getting asking back. about we had someone asking about um, diamonds on Jupiter. Diamond. We did share a post about that the other day. Other day, it's not not Jupiter, Neptune. We did share a post about that the other day. How it rains diamonds on Neptune. Right. Well, so some... they say diamonds are a girl's best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Just because the song says it doesn't make it true. What's a man's best friend though? A dog. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure who Getting... gets a better deal there? <laughs> I think I think the bloke's got the better deal. 
Saturn's rings are interesting because I go through phases of, through the years of uh, opening right up one way and then coming down and almost going. Um, it gets to the stage where for one month, Saturn's rings will be lined up edgeways and they're very, very, very thin uh, on edge and they almost disappear for one month. They're almost impossible to see. So um, I'm looking forward to photographing that one. Mm. <laughs> I'll put up a still image of the um, of Saturn, Mark, so that people can see what I, what can be done with the, what looks like a fairly blurry image that we're seeing on the screen at the moment. Yeah, so, okay, so you're going to show us a stacked image now. So this is the live image you're seeing at the moment, and Ron's going to show mm. us a stacked image. Here's the point where I'll put it. Oh, there we go. Someone just said, as long as you spell diamond, M-E-A-D-E. -E. I love it, Mead. Uh, what is the distance between Earth and Saturn, and how long would it take to get to Saturn from Earth? So it's let's talk light years again. 1.4 billion kilometres. There you go, 1.4 billion kilometres. Oh, also, when is Saturn closest to Earth? Uh, but it was closest, was it three months ago, Stuart? July, July. Hmm. Two months. How, close, how close was it? I'm putting you guys on the spot, I know. Uh, a little bit closer, but not much closer. In About. fact, it doesn't vary very much in size when it's closest to when it's farthest. That's a great image. Uh, so correct. this one of my closest images. Just yeah, that, is right to that Cassini division is very clear. I don't that know if the colours are accurate. It might be a bit over-processed, that one. But, um, uh, it's, yeah, it's good to see that. You can see multiple rings there, and uh, the shadow of the planet on the rings is quite clear over uh, over here on the right-hand side. In there. Yeah. Now, we have uh, – what is it? which are the best months for viewing the planets? Whenever they are up. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever they're the highest in the sky. Yeah. Yep. So but right now, currently, what was it's that? It's good for Jupiter at the moment. Yeah, at the moment it is perfect. Right now, Perry's right. Right now is a great time to view the planets. Well, yep. to view Jupiter and Saturn in particular. At the moment. Uh, and it's it's what Still about enough. a month from now for for Mars thereabouts, Perry? Uh, no, only about. Actually, you should start observing Mars now. Now, yeah. yeah. Uh, opposition and its closest point to us doesn't last for very long. So I think Stuart and all the planetary people, they make full use of any possible time that they can get on Mars uh, during that short period. So from now till maybe, would you say, January, Stuart, would be the best. Yeah, November, December, maybe. Yeah. All right. So, but, um, two years ago, it was um, a full blown dust storm. So, this year's, yeah. uh, we're looking forward to actually seeing some features on it. Yep. Yeah. So, what Stuart is actually talking about there, for anyone that um, doesn't know, there, the atmosphere on Mars isn't anywhere near as heavy as what it is on Earth. However, it does have some pretty good storms or winds that whip up the dust, a bit like the dust storms we occasionally get uh, from Central Australia or from Northern Australia, and but they're a lot heavier and they totally envelop the planet so that very little of the surface features are actually visible. And unfortunately, that happened last at the last close point to Earth, which was just uh, over two years ago. Stuart, did you manage to get any good pictures during that, or was it a total wipeout? Oh, I did near the end. So... I but um, initially, no, it was just all you, you could see the polar ice cap initially, and that was about it. Right. All right. So we've had we've had a question here that I can actually answer. Um, we if 
if we we're to, to loan an ASV telescope, November to January would be best. And it probably would be if you're looking for planets, but uh, loan scopes aren't happening at the moment. And I believe there's around about close to a 12 month wait, not a, not a six month wait, Rob. It's more, more likely a 12 month at the moment with COVID and everything that's going on. So the delays are um, quite, quite large at the moment. Um, not under yeah. our control, unfortunately. It's not under our control at all, which is unfortunate. Uh, it's just the way things are. Um, now, Noel is floating around in the background. I have dragged him in. Um, and somebody asked Noel, is it clear in Bendigo? It is clear here. Um, I'm just trying to get a, um, an arrangement on my rig that I've never used before. I'm trying to get that working, um, lined up, focused, stable, um, so I can be able to show you um, some planets from this point of view. But uh, yeah, it's um, a lot of fun doing things at the last minute with a different um, combination of gear in the dark, in the cold. So um, yeah, I'm just enjoying astronomy at the moment. Come on, Noel. Have we got something we can show? Because I know where Andy is, it's pouring with rain. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised it's clear here in Ringwood. It was raining. Oh, I know, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, the, the clouds amazing. cleared up. I was shocked. Yeah. Now, I know it's 9 30 and it's, it's it's fairly late, but I did forget something. Um, normally at a star party, we have the Lions Club attend and, and they feed us. They feed the ASV members who turn up for the night, they feed the general public who turn up for the night, but they haven't been able to do that. Uh, well, since the March star party. Um, so I'm just going to share on the bottom of the screen there, you'll see a link, uh, a My Cause link. We've also shared that link on our main Facebook page. We have a, a virtual sausage sizzle running. And um, you can go there and you can buy a snag or you can buy a snag and a drink or you can buy a, a burger. Uh, it's a virtual burger. And, and essentially you are just donating to the Heathcote Lions Club who do a, a whole lot of work for um, the local Heathcote area for uh, playgrounds and, and, and underprivileged. So uh, if you'd like to go to that link uh, and buy yourself a virtual sausage and a virtual drink or a virtual burger or even a virtual Christmas cake, uh, head on over there and, and, and purchase one for us. That'd be great. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm slewing around to see if I can find Neptune, Mark. Oh, you're going to Neptune. Oh, look at that. Uh, how much is an ASV mem membership, Susie? It is seventy-five. Sure it's, I can't tell if it's clear or clear out there. That's, the That's okay. Uh, seventy-five dollars, guys, for an ASV membership for a single. Uh, in that vicinity, I think. Yeah. Seventy-five or eighty. Yep. And there's a twenty-dollar joining fee. Yeah, it is seventy-five dollars for full membership. It's one hundred and ten for a residential membership, which means everybody who lives at the same residence as you gets a membership. Uh, and we have, um, oh, I've absolutely had a mind blank then. We have concession, concession memberships memberships for uh, $55. Uh, those apply for juniors, under 18s, and for people with uh, relevant concession cards. Um, so you can go to www.asv.org.au forward slash join. Apparently Swan Hill is nice and clear. Jen, if Swan Hill is nice and clear, could you please uh, get your equipment going and uh, help us out with some planetary observing? I can show you an image of Mars from 2018 if you want me to share. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. We've got uh, Ron is working his way to getting Neptune into play. And hello, yeah. Mr. Dave Painter. It is great to have you on board. It's not. It's not very spectacular on this. this uh, Neptune's not spectacular through. Um, oh, yeah, through that looks all right. Contact. So, look, there you go, everyone. That is Neptune live streaming <laughs> through your home at 9 40 p.m. on a Friday night. Yeah, in full color. <laughs> in all its glory, in all its beautiful, beautiful color. I think, I think I've got some clouds over there. Have some cloud moving through there. So does anybody have any questions about Neptune they might like to ask? Maybe not. It's disappearing.
Oh, look at that. Adrian playing the role of ASV member there. Yes, Jane, it is an annual membership, and Adrian is correct. It is well worth joining. Uh, what does a membership give you, Mandy? Membership gives you, at the moment, due to COVID. The whole universe. And it gives you the whole, yeah, Perry's right. It gives you the whole universe. Um, but it also gives you access to all of our um, closed closed streams. Um, so we have membership streams. We have a, a Deep Sky live stream at the moment once a month. We have uh, astrophotography streams once a month. We have uh, lunar and planetary. We have a... Uh, um, uh cosmology radio astronomy there are around about 20 different sections to the asv and they all have monthly live streams at the moment when covid 19 restrictions ease it gives you access to the uh dark sky site uh north of heathcote which is the leon mao dark sky uh, site accommodation, accommodation gives you access yeah. to the accommodation blocks that are on the site uh, it also allows you to learn to use the equipment, uh, so you can learn to be you can be trained on the 25 inch and the 40 inch telescope. So when I say 25 inch and 40 inch, we're talking about mirror size, so 25 inch mirror and a 40 inch mirror. Um, do courses? Yeah, it allows you to do the new astronomy courses with Perry. Uh, it allows you to go to um, instrument making sections. There's there's a whole lot that it does. Um, and it also allows us to do what we're doing tonight. I've got a couple of examples, um, if you like, um, yeah, now Mark, of, um, Mars mm -hmm. with with dust and without dust. Okay. Do you know how to share on on uh, on this lovely stream? So you need to click on the share screen at the bottom. Yep. And then you need to click the share screen button, and then go to application window and choose the window that you'd like to share with us. Can you see oh, that? Oh, there we go. Look at that. So that was uh, Mars on June the 22nd, 2018. As you can see here, there was um, um, detail on the poles, but not very much in between because of the um, um, planet-wide dust storm. Oh, you've lost it. Yeah. <laughs> on, screen. On, on, on purpose. All right. You need to and then... Later on, when the dust started to subside in October. Can you can was, you zoom in a bit on that one, Stuart? Can you make that a bit larger for us? Whoop. Try something that again, funny, Stuart. Something funny happened then. Everyone can see Ron hiding in his little uh, hoodie there in the corner. Oh, okay. It's going to be cool out here now. <laughs> it would be outside in the Ringwood in the middle of Melbourne in winter. Uh, well, spring now. <laughs> Well, we had snow today, so... We did. We had snow. We'll just go back to... Um... As soon as I can find it again, I'll get rid of it. Just bear with me. Oh, oh we lost, we've lost Perry. Mm. I don't know what's happened there. We've lost Perry. Let's, let's see if I can see my find Mars from here. A bit low in the sky, so it won't look very good. It's still there. Are you going to Mars? Are you? Yeah, I'm going to Mars. There's, there's one I took at Mars. A few so that's ago. a that's a, a stream of Mars that you took. Yeah, that's a. a um, someone has just said Mars is super orange from their backyard in Pasco Vale right now. Uh, yeah. We've also got a question: Why is Neptune and why are Neptune and Uranus the uh, ice giants? Come on, Stuart, this is your your territory. Why are they? Why are they the ice giants? Uh. Oh, you, you've stumped him. <laughs> uh, so someone's asked what causes the blue on Neptune? I'll have to leave that one to Stuart. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure, Stuart. No pressure at all. I'm, I'm still on the first question. <laughs> yeah, Uranus is kind of like more blue than or greeny sort of colour, and then Neptune is blue. They're both known as the ice giants. But why that is, um, 
I don't know if I've actually ever been asked that question before. But well, you have now. So you're going to have mm. to you're going to have to work out an answer that to that one. Mm. Now, Noel, do you have uh, any? Are you you set up yet to do some planetary or? No, I'm just hunting around for um, Saturn at the moment. Um, because it's a, a new rig, I haven't got a, a viewfinder aligned on it, so I'm just um, slewing around the dark until I see something bright. There you go. Oh, what do we got there? So uh, Uranus. I've just got to get a position. On Uranus. The just to go on. Uranus and Neptune. Um have bulk chemical compositions which differ from that of the larger gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn. For this reason, scientists classify them as the ice giants to distinguish them from the other gas giants. There you go. It would be the type of gases. It would be. Now, Ron, is this, is this Mars live? Yeah, this is Mars live. But it's very low go. in the sky. It's only up at... Uh, what is it, it is. It's, it's going to be it's pretty blurry. We have very fat now, so... so yeah, you won't get much sure better than that when it's so low. I think we might have two no, no. screens being shared and it booted. When a planet's very low in the sky, you're going through extra layers of atmosphere, so it's just going to cause dispersion. Mark, I've been booted out of much better places than this before <laughs> come on <laughs> this is the place to be at the moment yes but i always get back in <laughs> um, moved a bit i think um, i had it sitting right over the top of a speck of dust that was on the uh, on the corrector plate i think or on the mirror so just bridget, the bridget, bridget, thank you very much you're right bridget don't forget to thumbs up the youtube page guys for those of you who are watching us on youtube please give us a like just to it's explain clear. a little bit what's happening with ron's image of mars because mars is very low on the horizon ron's telescope is looking at it through the thickest possible layer of atmosphere so that doesn't make for very good viewing unfortunately so that's why we always try and observe the planets when they're at the highest above the atmosphere above the horizon or certainly at least maybe halfway up the horizon Yes, it's certainly uh, too low at the moment to get good images from. Some, somebody's asked a question. Uh, Bertikin has asked a question. Why is Uranus called a dwarf planet? It's not. It's not a dwarf planet no. at all. You're thinking of uh, a Pluto. On Pluto. Yeah. yeah, Pluto is a dwarf planet. So why is Pluto a dwarf planet? Even though we're, we're looking at Mars at the moment, but why is Pluto a dwarf planet? Well, the decision was made by... Do you want to answer it, Stuart, or should I? No, yeah, you can. What wasn't it? Wasn't it made by uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson? Didn't he decide it was a dwarf planet? He was uh, on the board. He was on the board. Yeah. There was a committee that was put together at the International Astronomical Union, uh, Astronomical Union, after a new body was discovered past Pluto that appeared to be larger than Pluto at the time. We now call that body Eris. And so what there existed at the time in the way of definition of what a planet is and what isn't a planet was actually nothing. There was nothing that defined what a planet was and what it wasn't. We just thought we knew what a planet was. However, this particular committee was charged with the responsibility of reporting back a means by which we can categorise planets which or the criteria that we would use to include something as a planet or not. And that criteria, the main one, 
apart from orbiting the sun, etc., is that it clears its own orbit of other uh, small bodies. So all the other planets appear to have done that. Mercury, Venus, Earth, there are no other smaller bodies of much appreciable size in those orbits because the planets have sort of collected them all. However, Pluto is in the thick of a belt of material out from the sun that it hasn't cleared. So it was decided that a new class of planet should be created and that would be a dwarf planet which is smaller and hasn't cleared its orbit of other material. Does that agree with your understanding, Stuart? Yep, yep. I had to come to some sort of decision um, because Eros was discovered. And there was another one as well, I think, Perry, which was also larger than Pluto. And I think well, I had to, to draw a line in the sand and say, do we keep adding planets on until we get to 30 or 40, or do we just call Neptune the last and uh, also for the other reason that you, you were describing? Yeah, the, the, uh, the little-known facts about Pluto are that Pluto is, in fact, smaller than our moon. Yeah. So it's not a very big body to begin with. What is it, about 1,200 kilometres in diameter or thereabouts? Um, I'll have to look that up. But it is smaller yeah. than our moon, but... Um... It's a pretty so, cool place because it's got five moons of its own, but it's very can I, small. Can I just jump in for a second, guys? Um, Ron, are you showing us the moon live right now? Yes, the moon, yes. This is the moon live, guys. Um, so I, I'm going to leave you with this for a second. I'll, I'll be back in a, in a minute. Um, we've got somebody else going to jump in and yeah. see if they can, uh, see if they can um, get some live stream happening. So... Guys, have a chat about the moon for everybody for one moment. Uh, but, Ron, is this it is... possible to zoom out to give us a, a better picture of exactly which part of the moon you're looking at? Well, not easily, Terry, because I've got a power mate on the telescope oh, and the camera okay. to work with to it. So. Yep. Sorry. That yes, looks that... a bit like Plato, is it? Or that crater? Uh... Or not? I'm not sure where I am actually on it. No, um, I don't think so. No? I'll, uh, I'll, see if I can, I'll move around a bit and see if you recognise something. Because so, I'm operating okay. at about about 5,000 millimetre focal length, so we're not seeing much of it. Um, okay. Yeah, you might have go. to go back to um, no Barlow. Yeah, I, I think I would. Yeah, I mean, I'll go down a bit, see if we can find something. Prime focus. Yeah, that'll give us a bit more. I'll, I'll do bit, that. Get a bit of perspective as to where we are. Yeah, I'll do that. So, um, well, Mark will need to go to another screen while I do that. And we are, we're at the bottom of it now. Okay. So, Is that mirror reversed or? Um, I no, I think it's. Right way round at the moment, I think. Okay. And what have we got there? Mare Chrysium, maybe? No. There's another one above it, isn't it? Yeah. It's okay. difficult to know what size we're looking at. Yeah, well, I'll go across to the edge and you'll see how... Oh, stop, 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 stop. Stop. Go back a little bit and go a little lower. And stop, go lower. This and is to, the left, to the left. To the left. A bit lower. A bit lower. I think, stop. There's Messier. So we're in... Um, Mare, yeah. 
Nectaris, I think, or no, not Murray, Nectaris, um, Sea of Fertility. So Definitely. up just to the left of the Astronomical of, uh, Society of Victoria sign is Messier A and B and the tail of ejector trailing up towards the top there. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Yep. That's where they That's believed a, um, a projectile or some sort of um, object went in one side and out the other. Okay. You can where see those two, the, the you can see the um, outcome, yeah. yeah. To the right is the sea of tranquility. To the right. Yep. That's it. Yep. There. Yes, I'll try to Harry, Mr. Mr. Dave Painter is wondering if earlier in the night when you were showing us the moon through starry nights, was it inverted as if it was through a telescope or was it a visual visual observer, uh, observation of the No, moon? it was visual. Yep. It was visual. There you go. He's well, just trying to trip you up. I'll change my scope. I'll take the power mate out so we've got a, a slightly wider view. So do you want to put, put some other screen up for a while, Mark? Uh, uh, we don't really have anything else to jump up for at the moment unless uh, Noel's got something to put up. We're probably only going to go for another uh, 10, or, 10 or 20 minutes and then we might uh, pack it in for the night because we've got plenty more to go for the rest of this weekend. Okay, that's well, I'll leave it there for this I won't bother changing it. So. We'll, we'll just roam around, see if we can find anything else on here that we recognise. Do you reckon you could try and tweak your focus slightly? Yeah, I'm using I'm the... Trying, uh, I'm not trying to be critical it. here. Yeah. <laughs> You can be critical. That's that's allowed. Ah, that looks good now. Yeah, much better. Yeah, I'm using the, the native mirror focus on this Schmidt Cassegrain because so, so travel can... travel back down again. Travel down. Yep. Yeah, because you're going into the darkness. Yep. Stay away from the darkness. Move <laughs> towards the light. <laughs> what's, what's that over there? I just, I just also like to remind people that uh, these streams are live. They're free. There is no cl links to click. Nothing at all. Um, at all. We've had a lot of spam coming through, and mm -hmm. it's it's been quite frustrating. That's for sure. Um, There's a nice little crater there. Hmm. You've got a nice balance, a white balance going there too. It looks good. Yeah. So for the people that are watching, the sun is at the left of the image. So the sun is shining from the left. And so you can see in that middle crater there that there's a shadow being cast because of the wall of the crater. And on the opposite side, is midday sunshine hitting it hard or sorry morning sunshine hitting it hard mm. and that's visible in all of those craters even the one to the bottom left there as well yeah, you can see the light around there and the shadow over here yep and sometimes you um the light is on the wrong side of the crater and then you realize it's actually a dome not a crater yes yes done that before too mm. yeah. see if we can might find one further over near the edge that's a dome there isn't it Difficult to tell, could be mm. a mountain. It's certainly, it's got to be high, doesn't it? Because the light's on the uh... yep, yeah, the shadow is being cast, is a little bit triangular, so maybe a mountain. Oh no, wait a minute, it's 
difficult to tell from here. Could be a dome. Yeah. Let's take it to the right. into the dark side there now. Let's go down. There is some interesting features. I finally got somewhere. Finally got Saturn in view. Oh, you've got Saturn in view. Okay. I was so going to say I can I can see Saturn now. Yeah, I can see Saturn too. <laughs> yep. No, it's very um, green. green. <laughs> Uh, didn't Perry? Did your cat just meow at us? Yes. <laughs> yes, Wanda. His cat just did meow at us. And for those asking, it's called Juno. Oh, it's a red satin no, now. No. no, his name is Jove, as in Latin. oh, Jove, or Jove, as in Jupiter. Yep, J O V E. e. Jove is in Jupiter. Yep. So once again, um, to our followers, I'd, I'd, I'd like to say, please do not click on any of the spam links that you see on our page. Uh, we are filtering through them as quick as we can. Uh, it is free. And if you see any spam links that ask you to enter any payment details to live to view the live stream, it is not correct. Okay. We, we've got people trying to remove these, but we, we've, we're, we are a non-profit. We are uh, everyone who does what they do, do it for the fun of it and, and the love of it, not because they're paid to do it. So uh, we're doing the best we can. All right. So have we? Oh. oh, someone thought it was their cat meowing. No, Sam, it was not your cat. That was Perry's cat, Juno. Joe, I oh, say Joe. I'll get it right, Perry. It's like it's like the issue I have between Noel and Neil. <laughs> well, at least you don't say Nile. <laughs> no, it's kilometer. <laughs> Somebody else thought it was their cat as well. Uh, yes, Don. The dodgy spammers need to be jailed if they spend as much time spamming as they did trying to have uh, legitimate employment. They'd probably earn the same amount of money. So we essentially we have behind the scenes here, we have, uh, other than the people you're, you're talking with at the moment, we've had about five people trying to uh, deal with this uh, as, as helpers, I guess, um, trying to deal with these scammers and spammers and responding to your questions throughout the night. So it's, um, it's not been an easy one, that's for sure. And you've done an extremely good job setting all this up, Mark. Oh, um, yeah, not just me, Noel, Noel and Linda. Noel Noel and Linda, Linda. Yeah. Noel's yeah. Noel's Excellent got job. Our lovely graphics that we've got here, and uh, I'm just the um, fabulous uh, job. I'm the delegator. Um, and Kitty, no, it won't be a problem with the raffle because the post will be posted by us on our Facebook page tomorrow. Um, so you won't get any confusion at all with the raffle. Um, if it's not the raffle link that's posted in our post with the image that is associated with it, um, you won't, you, you don't click on it. So you, you, you clearly see that it's one of our posts. We have nearly 20,000 Facebook followers at the moment. So you'll know it's one of our posts. Don't click on any of the links in the comment section. Just click on the link that's in the actual post itself and you should be fine. Now, Noel, how are you going there with your new equipment? We, we, we're getting the most bizarre view of uh, Saturn at the moment. It's it's lime green. Yeah, it's a bit crazy. I think Andy's got a pretty good view of the moon at the moment. Andy um, does have a very good view of the moon. Let's go to Andy. I know it's in, international. Oh, um, at the moment. It's ah, the very moon. nice. We have the moon mm -hmm. night tomorrow now. But let's go to the moon at the moment. Andy does have a very good view of the moon. Let's go to Andy. I know it's in, 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 in
the moon tomorrow night, but let's let's have the moon at the moment. All right. We've got some there nice go. feedback. All right. Yeah, that was from Perry. Perry's watching the Facebook feed. <laughs> Uh, Mariah, this this will be on our YouTube page. This will, this video should remain on our YouTube page for you to watch later on. So we can see what we were zooming up to before. You can, yes. And uh, while you guys discuss the moon at the moment, I'm just going to sit here and delete uh, spam. So what have we got? So Perry, you're on mute at the moment because you had Facebook going before, but are you able to discern what you can see at the moment? Um, well, we've got those areas that look darker. Uh, when they first started looking up at the moon before the telescope, they thought there may have been seas up there and they looked dark. So in Latin, they called them mare. In fact, they look dark because they're basalt. So uh, there's no water up there, certainly not now at least, but the name stuck and so all the darker areas made of basalt are uh, called mare from the Latin for sea. So oh, that's in, what we're looking at. I got in trouble the other night, Perry, when we were test streaming. I was jokingly call it, calling it mare. 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 <laughs> Nobody was happy. Nobody was happy. No. Did you get any nays, Mark? I didn't get any nays. Got a lot of yay. No, I got a lot of nays. No yays. Okay. All right. So that's a good image at the left of the moon, and there it comes. We've got some cloud moving through there. Okay. So Arno, you are spot on for the beginning. The eight-inch Dobsonian telescope is indeed recommended. Um, it doesn't matter what brand it is, does it, Perry? Just as long as Not it's really. an eight-inch Dobsonian, that that's all we're worried about for when you buy a telescope at the moment. Now, uh, someone's asking, or Dave is asking if you can put, point out the, the, the Mar Tranquilitatis. Did I say that right? Tranquilitatis. Tranquilitatis. Yeah. Sea of Tranquility. Sea, yeah, sea of Tranquility. Tranquility Base. Can I, uh, if we can scan upwards a little bit, we'll be able to see it. Because the one we're looking at now near the centre is the Sea of Serenity and now in the centre is the Sea of Tranquility. Okay, so a couple more objects. I think we might end up calling it for a night. It's uh, 10 o'clock now, so we'll turn past 10. So uh, as I said, we've got... Uh, so tomorrow we've got a live stream of the uh, of astrophotography for those who have digital SLR cameras. Uh, we have a live stream tomorrow night for... Uh, sorry, tomorrow during the day for astrophotography. Uh, we also have a live stream of the sun tomorrow if the clouds part ways. If not, we've got some video footage. Uh, oh, Perry, who named the seas? Uh, what country were they from when they named the seas? Um, well, it's in Latin, so mm. it would have to be maybe a, a Catholic country. It could be Italy, Spain, any of those. Um, but I'm only guessing about that because it was done before the invention of the telescope. So it's a long, long time ago. The telescope was invented over 400 years ago. So I'm not exactly sure who named them, but, oh, oh wait a minute. Do you mean as features or as, as features? features? Yes. Who named as them as features, features on the yes. moon? It was a map maker. Now, what is his name? 
Havelius, I think it may have been, but I could be wrong. It was one of the first guys that actually made a map of the moon. So come on, Perry, rack that brain of yours. Who was the first person? I, I, who think, his, I think his name was Hevelius with an I'll A. Try, I'll trust your judgment over mine, that's for sure. Oh. <laughs> okay, so uh, for those of you uh, still with us, if I can get my right screen going. Okay, so tomorrow at 1 o'clock we have an introduction to ASV astrophotography. Um, so we're talking about DSLR photography of the night sky. Uh, at 2.30 p.m. we have the solar viewing. Hopefully the clouds have cleared and we can do some solar viewing. If not, we have some pre-recorded stuff from earlier in the week that we can share with you. We can show you some solar flares uh, and the like. Four o'clock in the afternoon, we have um, the junior activity, which will be a presentation on uh, how galaxies are formed. At uh, 7.55, just before we start International Observe the Moon Night, we have the raffle draw for the mini guide scope from Sidereal Trading. Uh, and then at 8 o'clock, we start our live stream of Observe the Moon Night, followed at 9 o'clock by a live stream of Deep Sky Observing. Um, so please tune back in for, for those events tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow night or tomorrow during the day, you'll see the sun. You'll learn how to do uh, night sky photography using a DSLR. Uh, for the, those of you who have kids, you'll, your kids will learn about how galaxies are formed. And for those of you who want to learn about the moon, we'll go back to the moon tomorrow night. Uh, and we'll also start looking at galaxies and nebula tomorrow night, as well as globular clusters and open clusters. And we'll have our deep sky team on board for that. And of course, it's a great time to be doing this because there's no footy on this weekend. There is no footy. It's a perfect weekend where everyone's in <laughs> Melbourne. Everyone in Melbourne is in lockdown still. No footy yeah. to watch. No one cares about the rugby. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Sidereal Trading for sponsoring tonight's session and for donating the binoculars that we gave away tonight. Uh, thank you very much to the guys at Sidereal Trading for that. Uh, sorry, for Optic Central for that. <laughs> So uh, for Optic Central, for all your telescope needs, you can go and buy a Dobsonian from Optic Central as well. Um, that's for sure. Those they they have op, they have Dobsonians available to purchase. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. So we'll see you uh, tomorrow night. Good thank night. Good night.